I don't know if it's like an upload thing or a time of day thing or. I mean, I have the recordings. They're on my laptop. Oh, really? Yeah, they. I mean, they, they seem legit. I mean, they're two gigabytes in size. So they're filled with stuff. Move the right and you're like, no good now. All right. Shut up! Why is it cold in here? It's not. It's not cold in here. Do you want a handshake? It's like freezing. Okay, well, just because your hands are cold doesn't mean it's cold in here. We've been like, I, I've been like on beaches in like tropical areas. My wife's complaining that she's cold. <laughs> That's my point, is it's definitely not cold outside, yet she's still cold. Cir circulation thing. See, she's very impressed. Because my hands get that way. I understand. Understand. But does she care? She may. She's like 99.9% .9 positive <laughs> you are going to live. So, <laughs> so given that, you're like really low on the priority scale of like, it's like, wait. Well, yeah, like three minutes she's going to complain that her fingers are burning. All right, so let's see. Shut up! Where did we leave off last time? So we have our database connecting. I think I was walking you through the code, right? Um, if I remember correctly. So let's just jump back there. So right now when I go into, let me just minimize that. Let's blow this up some. All right. So as of right now, I'm still filling up my patient records uh, array with a whole bunch of blank patient records because we haven't taken our next step, which is going to be our first linear link data structure called a link list. Um, so I still need my big collection of objects that I'm going to use to fill my, um, uh, my lists, uh, my list views, because my array adapter requires me to, to give it all the stuff. All right. Um, then I create my an instance of my uh, patient record array adapter. So this is my custom version of array adapter. Why do I need a custom array adapter rather than just using the generic array adapter? What does a generic array adapter only work for? String, Go ahead. Single value. Single value of strings. So it knows how to load stuff into a text view on a, um, a, a, a row, custom row. Or a, yeah, I guess it would still be a custom row. But we've decided, you know what, we might want to lay out our patient records a little bit differently. So if you remember here, here's our list view row advanced that we created here. Okay, and this guy, you know, it's super complex. We have two rows, okay, instead of one row <laughs> of stuff. But you can expand that and, and say, okay, well, we can clearly do more than just two rows, right? We can have pictures and all sorts of widgets and things like that in there. Yep. Uh, is it picture stores as um, integer or is this string? It'll store to a an integer ID to an actual picture. But we haven't done that yet. We'll do pictures at some point. But everything is a unique ID to the actual resource. All right. So back here in Maine. All right. So that's why we built this patient record array adapter, which is this dude right here. All right, so our patient record array adapter starts off as being a generic array adapter. So that's what the, this extends thing does. This is called inheritance. All right, so we are seeing our brand new custom class here, patient record array adapter, will inherit all of its starting traits from plain Jane array adapter. Okay, so he starts off as that. Now, because normal array adapters, when we create them, they have several different constructors, but the one we've been using takes in a context, takes in a, the unique integer ID of the row that we should be inflating, the row that we're populating, as well as the collection of things that we are going to show. Okay? So because this is the constructor for my array adapter, this guy right here, I'm going to put a little comment before this. 
call my parents constructor. Okay, that has to be the very first line in your constructor. Now, you are not required to call your parents constructor, but we didn't write array adapter, correct? So there might be some magic going on inside of that constructor um, that does some stuff that we might need to have done to make sure our, you know, the correct scaffolding, scaffolding occurs. Uh, maybe a real life example of this is if you're building, I don't know, some kind of specialty house or something like that. At its core, it's still a house, right? And we're probably still reliant on them building like the frame of the house to keep the thing standing. Well, if the default house constructor is what builds that frame, and we have a class that extends that called custom house, we probably want to go ahead and still have that frame built. So we can choose to build it ourselves, or since the default house already knows how to build that frame, maybe we go ahead and ask him to build his frame and then we'll take it from there. Does that make sense? So that's really what we're doing here. We're saying, I'm building my own class. Now the fact that I have the word array adapter in here is just, you know, for human sake, that's not required. But I'm saying that this class extends this class right here. Right? This class name extends this class. So that means he gets everything that this class has, including access to the pointer that is the parent. Make sure we have that in the notes here. Do we have the super keyword somewhere in here? I'll just add it again, just in case. So super, remind me, what's the this keyword do? Yeah, so the this keyword is how an object references itself from within itself. So super is how a object references its parent from within itself. All right, so this is the inheritance model. So this is if a class inherits from a parent class, the super keyword will exist to allow the class to utilize the parent instance if they choose. Now at the beginning of this I said if a class inherits from a parent class. Is it even possible in Java for the super keyword to not exist? Or will it always uh, exist? Does every single Java class extend a parent class? <laughs> the answer is yes. Why? What if I have a class? Uh, do I, I think actually I do have a good one here. Where's my patient record? Do I have that guy up here? All right, here's patient record. So I have no extends up here, right? Forget about the implements thing. That's different than inheritance. If I don't say extends anything, does that guy inherit from a parent class? From object. Okay, so every single Java class automatically inherits from the default object class. That is the most basic um, representation of an object in Java. So even though we don't say extends object, there is an invisible extends object in here. Okay? And the extends would have to be before the uh, implements. Okay, so every single object extends at least, well, extends some other object. So if we actually go into our patient record array adapter, 
patient record array adapter extends array adapter. Now, if we go and look at array adapters, Okay, an array adapter is actually a base adapter, which is actually an object. So if we were to look at the hierarchy here for those guys, did I actually build it here? No. We have object. We have base adapter. We have array adapter. Then we have patient record array adapter. All right, so this guy is the top level that comes with Java. These two guys were written by Android and then we wrote this one. This is the hierarchy for our patient record array adapter. This guy, super from this guy's perspective is our instance of array adapter. Super from this guy's perspective is the instance of base adapter. Super from this guy's perspective is our instance of object. And that's the top of the line. That's how Java implements inheritance is having every, uh, Java implements object orientedness by having everything based off of a base class called object. Make sense? So this is what we just wrote. And we wrote it in terms of this guy, which was written in terms of this guy, which was written in terms of this guy. We didn't have control over either of these. Well, we didn't have control of anything from this point up. But most importantly for us, when we're writing our patient record array adapter, we didn't have control over this guy right here. That make sense? So we don't exactly know what's happening under the hood for that guy. Now, we can experiment some and see if calling the constructor or not calling the parent's constructor has a drastic change in uh, what we're doing, or we can just play it safe, which is what we did here. So in our patient record array adapter, I made sure my constructor for this dude took all the necessary pieces that were required to call the default constructor for array adapter. So if we look at array adapter in here, we'll go down to constructors. Notice there's a whole bunch of them here. One of them is something that takes in a context. The integer representation of the, the resource, this is the XML, what the row looks like, and then our array of some kind of objects. Make sense? All right, so this is the version of the constructor that we're actually calling. Even though we have several different constructors for array adapters. All right, so that's what I'm doing on this line right here. I'm saying array adapters, here's the three things that you ask for. I'm not sure what you're going to do with these, but go ahead and do your thing. And then I'll do my thing. Make sense? All right. So, but if you are going to leverage your parent's constructor, it has to be the very first line. And that makes sense because what if I had done these three things first, let's say, which those very well might be a waste of time. I just gave myself local access to them. But let's say I'd done those first. It's entirely possible that this constructor might undo something we just did, right? So that's probably not our intention. If we're, gonna, if we're setting some variables equal to stuff, it, we did it because we want to utilize that, those moves. We don't want to then risk having our parent, this, this constructor here, go and undo some of this stuff. So that's why if you're going to call your, the parent's constructor, it has to be the very first thing you do in the constructor. You can have, com you can have comments before that, but it has to be your first syntax line. All right, that makes sense? All right, and then in general, calling the parent's constructor is probably a good idea. Um, 
I would maybe pull up a little bit short of saying it will never hurt you, but I would say it almost would never hurt you. You might just sometimes be wasting your time doing some calling to the parents constructor that you're just going to undo right afterwards or something like that. All right, so we went ahead and just let a Ray adapter do its magic, whatever that is. And then just for the sake of making sure I had easy access to them, I went ahead and gave myself local variables for those three parameters, uh, even though I can get them from a Ray adapter. If we go and explore a Ray adapter, there's a function called get context. There's another function called get collection or something like that. Um, and there's another one called get count that will mess with some of those things. But rather than doing too much with that, I just said, look, I'm gonna give myself local access to those three variables so I conveniently have, have access to them and I don't have to worry about the way array adapters exposed that information to me. All right, so I'll let the constructor do its magic, then I'll just locally remember these three pieces of information in case I need them. Make sense what's going on there? All right, this is the magic piece, okay? Understand, I think we mentioned this last time, but what, what's the job of an array adapter? If you had to concisely tell me what an array adapter does, what does it do? And its name gives you a lot of information about this. And you can't just say adapts an array. I need the, I need the, rest, I need the rest of the sentence. In fact, you can start with that. It does adapt an array. It adapts an array to what? Hmm? Into a list view? Into, yes, specifically what part of a list view? Kind of like string format? Mm. Anything when you start off with kind of, that makes it real vague, right? Okay. <laughs> but not really a string format. Go ahead. A layout? A layout for our rows. Yeah, so we built kind of this specialized layout for each of our rows that we are going to use for our what would I call it, a patient record, right? The, the guy with two, two rows, right? It's it got two text, text views in it. All right, so I built this specialized thing. Um, so what an array adapter does is it adapts a collection, an array, to some unique layout. That makes sense? Because our collection that we created here, this guy is expecting me to give it in our case here, two strings, right? I have two text views. But did the people who created the default array adapter, did they have any idea how I was gonna design my row? No. Did they have any idea what the fields and constructors and things like that inside of my patient record was gonna look like? So they had no way of designing array adapters to be compatible with something that I didn't invent till the future, right? Okay, so they gave me, but they did know that strings existed. So what they gave me is a base kind of ability of an array adapter. They said, look, if you give me a collection of strings and then you give me a row layout that only has a text view in it, I'll shove those guys together. I'll adapt your array for that. Does that make sense? That's the default array adapter. But if you're going any more complex than that, and that's actually only a, let's call it a partial truth, but we're doing it this way. If you're going any more complex than that, you're going to have to build your own array adapter. That makes sense? Now that sounds intimidating on the surface, but when we look at our array adapter here, I just happen to name this guy patient record array adapter. I could have called that guy elephant if I wanted to. I made him extend array adapter though. That makes him an array adapter. I just went ahead and towed the party line here and called the parents constructor to build whatever it needs to build. Then I just locally held on to those other three pieces of information. The real magic here is this function right here, get view. The default get view that we inherited from array adapter, that guy's job by default, well, what he does by default is he marries a string to a text view that's in our row. In this case, I don't have strings. My collection is of patient records and my row is a little bit more complex. That makes sense? So I have to 
override this get view. I have to write it myself, give myself my own version of this guy that will get called ahead of the parent's version of this. And inside of here is where I will inflate my list item, grab my two text views, and also grab my patient record from the position we're currently getting the view for, and then fill in my text views with those two pieces of information. Ultimately returning my row. My list item is the row that we inflated and filled up with the patient record information. Make sense? That's what get view does. It adapts the types of objects that live inside of our array to the rows in our list in our list view. Okay, that makes sense. The job of an array adapter, it adapts the array for something. Okay, I think it'd be used for other things, but right now our, our whole world world is around list views, so we're just going to pretend like that's all they do for right now. All right, questions about the job of an array adapter. Questions about the reason that we need custom array adapters for. Uh, um, doing anything above strings and single text view rows. All makes sense. The Android and the Java people, they weren't able to guess about, about every single thing we were ever going to invent in their languages. So we have to do a little bit of the heavy lifting ourselves. All right, so do you see, I'll just go ahead and minimize these couple things. My patient record array adapter, this guy just has two things in it. A constructor that probably could have been one line long and my get view, which needed to be as long as it needed to be to adapt my data type to my row. Not a whole lot of stuff going on there, right? But important stuff and it needed to be put in the right places inside the right functions. If we don't override specifically this get view function that takes these exact parameters, if I just um, uh, wrote a function called get special view, that guy won't automatically get called. The list view specifically uses array adapters in a very specific way. Every single time it's ready to fill in the information for a row at a certain position in the list view, it calls its array adapters get view function for that position. It says, give me the view for position three or for position four or for position five. And it says, here is the layout that I want you to fill in. Here's what the row looks like. Make sense? And then this last parameter, which we're not using here, deals with the parent object of it. So in our case right now, this would be the list view. If for some reason you needed direct access to that list view. But notice this is written pretty generically. It's written as a view group and a view here. So that kind of supports what I'm saying is that array adapters are not just for list views. In fact, modernly, they're not even for list views at all since list views are kind of uh, going away. So now we have these things called um, uh, recycler views and then there's some other objects but punchline is is an array adapter can be applied to a various things we are using it with list views all right so questions about this guy understand what he's what he's accomplishing all right so back out here main activity this is where I'm creating my instance of my patient record array adapter. I'm passing it the context. What is context? When I first introduced this, I kind of said it's like this weird thing to wrap your mind around. Can you give me a decent definition of what context is? What's kind of good? I think that's more right than wrong. When we think about real life, when we say context, what are we talking about? Everything surrounding like the word or 
Yeah, when, when something's occurring, the context of where it's occurring has to do with the environment around us, right? The people that are there, the room that we're in, all sorts of stuff, right? I think I mentioned, you know, the, that word comes up pretty often when it deals, you know, we're really in two things in our world today. So we can say, you know, the Bible, right? A lot of people want to, you know, read one passage from the Bible and take it out of context when, I mean, the Bible is maybe the, the hardest one to follow, let's say, because the context sometimes goes way beyond a chapter or a book. Right, you have the context of the entire Bible, and that's why we need the theology people to help guide us. Um, and then even they are confused, so it's like the blind leading the blind. So <laughs> we, we, just, we just hope for the best. Um, but that's that's a place where we use context very often, right? We just use that term because it's so easy to just grab a a certain sentence or something like that and say, "Well, this obviously means this." Where you have to take the context in which something was said into consideration. And then, you know, we hear it all the time on the news when it deals with politics, right? You know, such and such comment was taken out of context or something like that. Okay, so the idea is that when we say something, you know, it's not just the exact words that we use, it's also the context in which we said those words, right? So context as it relates to our Android applications here has to do with the situation in which we are performing a task. In this case, what we're doing is we are delivering a row um, filled in with some stuff, okay? And that, row, and that row is built in the context of something. Probably the easiest way to think about it in Android is to consider each screen of our application as kind of like a room, something like that. Because a context can also be another view, but let's just leave it at, let's just assume for right now our contexts are always activities, which effectively are screens in our application. So what we're really saying is, is what screen are you building this view for? And that's important for the way that Android applications are built because the, the views are inflated inside of a screen and then they're, they have their sub views inside of view groups and this kind of stuff. But when we pass it that context, we're saying, look, you're going to be inflating this row on this screen. It's important that the, the row knows about this guy. All right. That's just part of how inflating rows works or inflating any view works. We're calling them rows here because that's what we're doing. But really what we're doing, I think I talked about it like a circus clown. Right? He comes out with the, the empty balloon, blows it up. He's inflating it in um, inside this room you know, in a certain activity okay so patient record adapter i'm passing it all the same stuff i would pass a normal um, array adapter i'm saying here's your context here's the row and notice the context here is just this this is how an object refers to itself from within itself so this is a pointer to whatever this guy is and this guy is an instance of app compat activity. Well, specifically an instance of main activity, which is a app compat activity. So this is a pointer to an activity. Everybody cool with that? All right, then we're giving it an integer and that integer right there is the unique social security number or something like that, however you want to think about it, of our row that we built. Okay, every single time we build a view or every single time we have a resource in an Android application, it's assigned a unique integer that uniquely defines it. Okay, so that you won't have more than one resource with the same uh, ID. And then lastly, here's the collection of stuff that I want to put into that, that list or into, into that adapter. Okay. Those are the three pieces of information, and then that guy does the magic inside. Then I go ahead and grab my list view, and I set that list view's adapter equal to my patient record array adapter, which is a array adapter. Patient record array adapter is an array adapter, which is a base adapter, which is an object. Make sense? This is not an Android thing. That is not a Java thing. That is an object-oriented language thing. Object-oriented languages 
have hierarchies of objects that are all based off of a base object. When you take the 470 class and we build an object-oriented programming language, you'll see that one of our primitives that we build is a generic object that then has your other objects based off of it. Okay? All right, and then we have our listen for database changes stuff going on. All right, so this is inside of our core. So I'll go in here and we are listening for database changes. So one of the things that we have, so this is something called async. Did I talk about async last time? All right, so we have this thing called the observer design pattern. So we've, now we've learned, this is our third design pattern, right? We've learned about MVC, model view controller. We've learned about singleton. And now we're learning about the observer design pattern. Uh, the observer design pattern says, it's a good idea to be productive while we wait for some event to occur. Make sense? Good idea to be productive while we wait for some event to occur. Now, what I mean by that is, uh, let's say that you're waiting for, I mean, even though this isn't really how humans work, but let's say that you're waiting for a phone call of whether or not you got some job. Okay, you're waiting for that. And you're real anxious about it. You're, you know, you're you know, sitting there staring at the phone, waiting for it to ring, blah, blah, blah. It would be in your best interest to keep yourself busy while, until that phone finally rings, right? Sometimes easier said than done, but you know, maybe you go play video games, maybe you clean house, whatever you are, whatever you're doing, but you're off doing other things. And then when that specific event occurs, when the phone rings, that then alerts you to pause what you're currently doing and go do, and go deal with that, right? And that seems like a relatively efficient way of going about life, sound good? Okay? As opposed to just sitting there in your living room staring at the phone for hours when you could be doing other things, knowing that that phone may never ring. Even though it was supposed to ring that day, you know, they said, yeah, we'll call you by 5 p.m. on Thursday. And, oh, yeah, we got busy, blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, we didn't know how to tell you that we were going to fire you, so we just decided to ignore you. You know, just, you know, that kind of thing. So we all can agree that that seems to make pretty good sense, be productive, and then just get alerted so you can take care of the phone call when it comes in. That's what the observer design pattern says. All right, now we have called this patterns of communication. We have a synchronous pattern and we have an A Synchronous, synchronous pattern. And we're going to use some uh, terms I think we've used before, but if we haven't, uh, this will be the first time you see it. A synchronous pattern is a blocking pattern, whereas an asynchronous pattern is a non blocking pattern. And what this means is when we wait for an event to occur, um, additional progress in the app cannot occur. We are blocking future progress. Okay, we're just sitting there waiting for the phone to ring. That's synchronous. Make sense? Asynchronous is when we are, when we wait for an event to occur, additional progress in the app can occur. So even though I'm waiting for this phone to ring, I say, I'm going to wait for you to ring, put that over to the side, 
that I'm going to go do other things. This is occurring asynchronously. Make sense? The common way we handle asynchronous patterns in computing is through multiple processes. This is, let's call this historically. And more recently, multiple threads. Okay, so we spawn a thread of execution to handle the asynchronous event. Right, so the magic that's actually happening under the hood here that we're going to point to in a second, but we'll do the real life thing, is I'm kind of, um, I don't know, making a lightweight clone of myself. So I'm going to say, you sit here and wait for that phone to ring, and you scream when it rings. So I don't want to miss it, even though the phone has a ringer. But you know. This guy's happening in his own little world, in his own thread. All right? And then the main thread can go off and do other things related to the program. Respond to users clicking on the app, scrolling through stuff, things like that. You know, everything else is still going while this guy's just sitting here cooking, possibly never occurring. All right? We are using some system resources to keep this thread alive and having it sit there and monitor this communication channel. But it's not preventing us. It's not blocking us from continuing on in the application. All right, that makes sense? All right. So whenever we do something synchronously, we block. Whenever we do something asynchronously, we don't block. Is asynchronous better than synchronous? Depends on the situation. Okay. Sometimes we need the information from something before we can proceed forward, right? If you want to get some bubble gum out of a bubble gum machine and the bubble gum machine takes a quarter and you're going to ask somebody for a quarter, you can't just spawn off a thread and say, give me a quarter when you have time and then walk up to the bubble gum machine without a quarter okay, and continually just trying to put your nothingness into the bubble gum machine. You're never going to get the gum, right? <laughs> you can destroy the machine. <laughs> that's, that's right. Um, okay, so that would be an example where when we ask for the quarter, we need to block. We need to wait for that response. And only when we get the quarter will we continue on with the next step because we were reliant on the result of this step to do the next step. That's where a synchronous pattern makes sense. But in many cases, like in our case here with the, you know, the example of the phone call, an asynchronous pattern is the perfect situation. We don't know if that phone's ever going to ring. We're hoping it does, but we don't know if it ever will. So we're going to go off and we're going to do other things and be as productive as possible, only to be alerted when it finally rings. That's an asynchronous communication pattern. Okay, that makes sense? Both of them have their place. So sometimes you will um, hear this referred to as synchronous versus asynchronous. I think more commonly in programming, you will hear this in terms of blocking or non-blocking. All right, so when somebody says something blocks, that means it blocks you from moving on in your program. It prevents you from making additional progress because you're waiting for something to occur. You're waiting for the result of a function call or something like that. Non-blocking means it does not block you from making progress. All right, sound good? So what's actually happening in here? So I have this function I wrote called listen for database changes. Again, that's just what I named this function. This guy could have just as easily been called elephant or my little pony or something like that. Doesn't, doesn't matter. All right. But it does listen for changes to the database. So I gave it an appropriate name. All right. And this guy is an asynchronous listener. So built into Firebase, well, the API we get, we get this thing called a value event listener. Okay, this is a value event listener. And we are, this is actually the name of a class. Now, this syntax you see here, it doesn't have to be this exact way. Um, we can choose to go write our own class 
that extends value event listener very similarly to what we did for array adapter. All right. In fact, we can actually make our array adapter the same way as we did our value event listener here. If we want to kind of inline extend it. So what this guy is doing is that saying, look, I'm going to create a plain Jane value event listener called PR listener. And this guy is going to be a new plain Jane value event listener. You could have replaced those uh, things with, I want an array adapter called AA, which is going to be a new plain Jane array adapter. But I'm going to override a couple of those things in there. Things that I did in my custom array adapter, I could have done on the fly here. We didn't because, you know, that might start looking kind of crazy here with a lot of code. Um, you can make the same argument here. You can say, well, if the stuff you're overriding here takes up too much space, maybe you decide to go ahead and put it in your own class. You know, so maybe you have something called like my custom value event listener, which extends value event listener. And that guy overrides a method called on data change, stuff like that. Okay. But this is a way to do it kind of in line. So I'm creating a plain Jane value event listener. But off the end of it here, I have an opening and closing parenthesis, uh, opening and closing curly brace. All right, with a semicolon at the end of it. This is allowing me to provide it with overriding methods. So inside of here, rather than the default on data change uh, method, which probably does nothing, I've decided, you know what? When the database changes, when the data changes in the database, I want the phone to ring. Okay, make sense? I want to be notified when that data changes because I want to do something. And maybe I want to update my array of patient records. Maybe I want to tell my array adapter to update itself so my list view updates, that kind of stuff. Make sense? Okay, I want to be notified of that. Okay, then we have this other function called on canceled. This is like, you know, if there's an error or something like that. So this is something we, we would hope doesn't get called. But just in case, we wrote a little debugging stuff in here so we can go and find out why this got called. My experience has been when this function gets called, it's almost always your internet connectivity is dropped out. Something like that. Every now and then it'll be Firebase is having some uh, issues, but generally speaking, your Wi-Fi is down. You know, you're trying to communicate with the cloud and there, there's no communication occurring. Okay. So what this guy right here is doing is it is creating a value event listener that will listen to changes to the database. And we've overridden one function called on data change that gets something called a data snapshot. So that shows me the current information of the database, the data that's actually changed. All right. And then I can do logic in here. So what am I doing right now? I'm printing out that data snapshot so we can see what it looks like. You'll see it's going to look like JSON. And then I'm going to spin through that data snapshot. So uh, because the data snapshot is actually a collection of data snapshots, and that'll make sense when I show this to you. And then for each one, I'm going to go ahead and build up patient records. So I'll build a new patient record. I'll just print out data changed. So notify myself, the command, you know, out at uh, logcat that, oh, this function got called. And then I'll go ahead and just tell that patient record to display itself, just proving that I was able to rebuild my patient record. The idea is that my database is going to hold a collection of patient records. That's what I ultimately want to happen. So I want my database here. So here's Firebase, and among, uh, among certain things, he's going to hold patient records. Now, we saw last time we looked at that function called push. What does the push function do? Gives a unique ID to, uh, <laughs> all right, so when we push something, we will have, 
you know, a random unique ID followed by a patient record. Make sure I put, it's definitely a different one. Yeah. All right, so what push does is it generates keys that look like that. You know, unique ways of identifying this particular row in my uh, uh, database. All right, so up in Firebase, I'm gonna have a collection of patient records where each patient record is going to be a unique identifier associated with the JSON representation of that patient record. Make sense? Okay, that's what I'm actually planning on storing. So back out here, when I get my data snapshot, what I'm actually getting is a collection of unique identifier patient record pairs. That's why I have to peel it back one level. So I'm saying for each internal data snapshot that lives inside the children of this guy. So the children of this, my I'm looking at the patient record here, the patient record here. I don't want the top level object that's this entire thing. The ID patient record pair. I want just the patient record. So I gotta peel it back one level to get to the actual list of patient records. Okay. So I'm getting my list of patient record pairs and then I'm saying get the value that is a patient record from that and go ahead and build my patient record that way. All right, but this is all happening asynchronously. So that's only gonna get called when my database actually changes. And that can happen when I add something new to the database from my program, or if I go up to the database and I just start changing stuff in the actual website, this guy will get called as well, all right? So this builds the listener, this then attaches that listener to a specific reference to my database. So this allows me, so if I go to core my ref, here's my ref, I'm only listening to changes to the patient's directory, if you want, if you will, uh, in my database. I can set up a different value of that listener for a different part of the database. So you can be granular. You can say, look, I care when patience gets updated. I don't care when a user has logged in or when somebody's changed their password. I don't need to respond to that event. That's just let it happen, let it do its thing, but I don't need to deal with that. that Makes sense? So you get flexibility with Firebase to choose which things you're interested in and which things you're not. All right, so the database reference that I have here in core is specifically the patient's table, patient's directory, however you want to think about it, up in Firebase. Okay, so I'm saying I'm going to connect to that reference, this value a listener, and that then creates a thread. Magically, we don't have to do any of the multi-threading stuff. It creates the thread that will listen for changes to the patient's table while I go off and do other things, okay? And what that ultimately says here is inside of main activity, when I call this function here, core.listen for database changes, this is non-blocking. That means I immediately will get to the next line here. My program keeps running. If it didn't, if this was blocking, I would be locked inside of onCreate here in my main activity. So my screen would not actually show up until there was finally a change in my database. Make sense? Not what we want. You don't want your applications to uh, take an indefinite uh, amount of time for them to finally launch. They already do that sometimes. <laughs> and what, what do we wait? We wait about three or four seconds but we just assume something's wrong and close it and re relaunch it. And then after about the fifth or sixth time, you probably are not on the internet. I 
bless the app you are running is related to like rooting your phone or or jailbreaking your phone and they're like all right well something's not right here or a virus just got installed or whatever okay so we make sure make make sense what's going on there okay so right here i'm saying look i am interested in things that get changed in the patients table of my database that's all i'm saying there okay now for right now i guess i gotta leave that stuff in there it's not gonna hurt anything all right so when i built this array adapter i gave it my list of patients and most of my patients were empty correct mm -hmm. that i built right here so here's all my empty patients now when i go into there's a patient record add new activity this guy here All right, so this guy shows me my little form for adding a new patient. The on add button pressed, I grab my widgets. I read in first name, last name, middle initial, uh, age, and um, build a patient record out of that. And then we add that patient record to my, um, you know, add that patient record to core in whatever way that means. Okay, and we talked about this last time. So I'll go into core and we're going to look at add patient record. This guy's going to take an instance of patient record in as a parameter. So we go to core. Here's add patient record. And right now I'm actually doing several different things in here that is kind of showing the evolution of what we've done over the last couple of weeks, right? So the first thing I'm doing is I'm storing the patient record inside of an array of patient records. Then I'm storing a string representation of that patient record inside of an array of strings related to my patient records. That was for our plain Jane array adapter version. Then I'm incrementing my actual core number of patients. because those are two different values, right? I have an array of a thousand things of which I've only actually put now one thing in there, even though I have a whole bunch of empty patient records inside there. Okay, so that guy's keeping track of how many actual patient records I have instead of placeholders. And then this last thing, this is the Firebase one where I'm saying I'm going to write a patient record to Firebase. And I'm passing this guy a patient record object. So that's this guy right here. So when I write a patient record to Firebase, this is pretty easy, right? So I'm going to take my core dot my ref. Uh, I'll go ahead and say core dot my ref here just to be explicit. But why didn't I have to say core dot right here? Why was that optional? Inside of core. I'm inside of core. And here's my ref. What kind of animal is this? It is public. I'm asking you to tell me you know how, how it works, not that you can read. Okay, it is a database reference. Would it be fair to say this guy's a variable? Yeah. Specifically, he's a field of the core class. Yeah. Okay, because objects, classes, they have three things, right? They have fields, they have constructors, they have methods. I don't have any constructors in here, but I have fields and I have methods. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Anything else you want to say about this guy? Kind of that thing I've been harping on for basically a semester and a half now. What does it mean for him to be static? The user needs to, or to access it to call it um, based on the class that defined it. Okay, so he's owned by the class. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if we want to access this guy, we say the name of the class dot the field, my ref. So that would be core dot my ref. All right. Now. Tell me about this guy. What kind of animal is that? It's a method. Okay. How do you know it's a method? Okay. Yeah, I've got have some parentheses, parameter list. Doesn't have to take in anything. Could have an empty parameter list, but yeah. So this guy's not a field. It's not a constructor because his name's not core. So must be a method. All right. Um, what kind of method is he? Class method, how do you know? Static. Is he static? Public isn't important for that, but the static part is important. Okay, so he's 
He's static. And uh, how do you call class methods? Using the name of the class in which the method was defined. Did we do that down here? Yep. Uh, but for the same reason I'm going to explain up here, this is not required either. So, but let's just start off up here. Why is this guy not required? This is going to connect uh, a loop that we've talked about today. Go ahead. Because the context in which it was written is the class that it needs. Okay. Um, we're going to um, we're going to give full credit because you said the word context, which is correct. Okay. This guy, what's happening in here, is happening inside of a static context. That means any of the static things that belong to the same context are directly accessible in here without me given, giving the full path to it. So since this is a static context that lives within the core class, I would have direct access to all of the other static things inside of core. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Having said that, you will never be wrong to go ahead and fully express exactly what you mean. So you can, I mean, you should understand that static versus non-static context thing. If you're in a non-static context, the this dot stuff is presumed. If you're in a static context, the name of the class dot stuff is presumed. But in either of those places, in either of those places, um, here, I can show you what I mean by that. So, what kind of animal is this guy? Constructor. Constructor. Okay. Again, we have three options, right? Field, constructor, methods. How do you know he's a constructor? It's all the name of the class. Yeah, it looks like a method y thing with the parentheses, mm -hmm. but specifically, its name matches the name of the class, therefore, he's a constructor, right? Does this have static as part of it? No. Therefore, this would be a non-static context. And in non-static contexts, the this dot stuff is presumed. I don't need it there. Can you really tell it's I will. Okay, but we're actually not done. I did need it here. Why? Because local, so. Yeah. So. I need the this dot here, not because of the context. I need it here because the name of my variable here is first name, and the name of my variable here is first name. So in order for me to fully express what I'm setting to what, I need to say this dot here, because variables always resolve to their most local definition. So if I leave the this dot off here, that's a perfectly legal line of code. But what this is saying, I'm setting this guy equal to himself. When I actually want the guy up here to be equal to him, to be equal to the guy that was passed in. So the this dot here is required for clarity to take the ambiguity away from what I'm setting to what, not because it's required because of context. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But again, that statement of saying the name of the class dot is never wrong, saying this dot is never wrong. So rather than having to juggle in your head what context ultimately means, which is important that you understand, you'll never um, make an error related to context if you make a habit of saying this dot versus name of the class dot. All right, so let's put this, so we'll call this contexts. Let's call it a Java contexts. Really, it's object-oriented language contexts, but we'll just say Java context here since that's what we're looking at. All right, so static context versus non-static context. 
static context exists in methods slash constructors, uh, although constructors is incorrect because you, you create a static constructor. I don't think so. So this exists in methods. So where the static keyword is present, anything within the method is said to be occurring within a static context, which means the name of the class is implied before member calls. And then the non-static context exists in methods slash constructors where the static keyword is not present. Anything within the method is said to be occurring within a non static context, which means the this keyword is implied before member calls. That makes sense? Okay. Um, this is probably not something I would directly text, test you on. That isn't to say it's not really important. I want to focus on the applied aspects of what we're doing here, as opposed to the theoretical aspects of what we're doing here from a, I guess a testing perspective for right now. So I'm, I'm definitely not saying ignore this, okay? But it is kind of a, Not a difficult, but a somewhat abstract idea. Is that a fair statement? So if anything, I would say, I would encourage you to always use this keyword or always use the name of the class when it's implied so that you never run into problems. What I will say is um, I'll definitely take off points when that mistake is made. So you should at least understand this concept to the point that you understand when you need it and when you don't need it. And if you want to play defense, always use the this keyword when it's allowed. Always use the name of the class when it's allowed. Don't choose to use it or not use it depending on what's implied. Got it? All right. Oh, I, so the actual example. Okay, so here in core, because this method has a static keyword before it, everything that's occurring inside of this guy is happening within a non-static context. So I'll put a little comment here. This is a non-static context. Therefore, core dot is assumed to be there. You don't need it because this guy is a non-static context inside of a class called core. Therefore, he has access to all of the static members of core directly. Okay, so I don't have to say core.myref there for the reason that this guy is a, um, I'm sorry, this is not a non-static, this is a static context. 
Since this has a static keyword here, this is the static context. Therefore, I do not need the name of the class here. But what I'm encouraging you to do is use the name of the class anyways. It's never wrong. Provided you're accessing a static method or a static member. Okay. So write patient record to, the, uh, to Firebase. Takes in a normal patient record like we designed many, many classes ago. We... Go ahead and grab our reference to the patient's table in our database from core. We call push, which gives us that unique identifier. And then we say we're going to set the value inside of uh, the database equal to that guy. Make sense? And that will update the actual database. Non-static would be over here in patient record. Yeah, here's, um, here's like get name string. So this guy returns a string. There's no static here. Therefore, this is a non-static context. So I technically don't need to say this dot first name or this dot middle initial or this dot last name. Because these guys are non-static fields inside the class called patient record. So since I'm inside of a non-static context inside of patient record, the this dot is presumed to be there. Question is, how do you know when do you use the static context and when do you use non-static? That's a different argument because that comes down to uh, the use of static versus not static. And I don't have a good example to show you when and the, the, the punchline would be, we're going to create many patient records. So we want many unique patient records. That would lead to non-static variables, non-static stuff. We want each instance. We, we want instances of that guy. Therefore, we want each instance to have its own collection of stuff. Whereas core, we only want to exist once. Okay, that's a single global variable. So that would be filled up with static stuff and static context because it's just like a factory that we call upon. All right. That sounds like the use for static. Yeah. Sorry, I think I'm wrong. It's, it's kind of off the back there. So um, when we use a static keyword, we can't have any more instances of, of that class. No, you can. You can, have a, you can have a class that has static and non-static stuff in it. Okay. So you can have a class that has I mean, nothing keeps me inside of patient record from having a public static string <coughs> class name patient record. And because this guy is static, he's owned by the class, I would access him by saying patient record dot class name. You might say, well, is that worth anything? Is that any good? Maybe the answer is a lot of times no, but it's legal. Okay. Similarly, I can uh, have a um, public static do something or public static void, let's say. Do something. System.out.println live from a static context. All right, and since this guy's static, I would call him by saying patient record dot do something. Okay, so they can live together in the same class, that's fine. But I guess this is kind of what he's Are there legit why, why examples you, why, why, of- Why would you use stat, like if- the, You want to know if there a legitimate class. example of when this yeah. would make sense. Well, yeah, like instead of having just like a regular um, non-static context of class. I'll show you. This is the big integer class in Java. And you create instances of this guy. So most of his fields and stuff are instance fields and instance members and stuff like that. This is for creating arbitrary size numbers. 
bigger than long, stuff like that. But he does have some static fields. He has one for the big integer representation of the number one or the number 10 or the number zero. So these are kind of convenience things. So you don't actually have to create an instance of big integer that is for the number one. You might do things with a one or a 10 or a zero. Those kind of are maybe common numbers you might work with. Mm -hmm. So rather than having to actually go and say, big integer one is equal to new big integer and passing it a one, you could just say big integer dot one. And now you have that, uh, an instance of a big integer that is the representation of one. Even though most of the things you do with big integers, um, you know, here you can do like a big integer divide. So big integer divide takes in a big integer and divides the big integer that called this guy, because this is an instance method, a non-static method. So you would have a big integer seven and you want to divide the big integer seven by the big integer two, giving you the big integer three, right? Um, or maybe you want to say the big integer 70 divided by the big integer 10, giving you a 7. So what you can do is you can have a big integer that holds the number 70, and you could say, maybe that's called b. You could say b dot divide big integer dot 10, instead of having to create your big integer that holds the number 10 and then dividing it. Um, it's for like hard coded values like that math library. Okay. You might have uh, like pi, mm -hmm. um, or like the exponent or uh, base 10 log. Those things would be hard coded into it. So like math dot pi, where there may actually be things in there that are non static things, but whenever you need pi, you can just say math dot pi. Okay. So that would be so, a use of static things. So like if it was, if, um, Big integer 10 wasn't static, would you not be able to use it in the way it's being used right now? Like, like I'm, trying, I'm trying to distinguish the... the you would have, you could, you would just have to make, it would be, in, it's con there for convenience. You would have to make your own big integer. You'd have to say, big integer uh, B10 is equal to new big integer passing it a 10. Okay. Instead of that though, you could just say big integer dot 10. Because big integer dot 10, is a static field that lives inside of big integer, and this is the big integer representation of 10. It's already built for you, for convenience, since you might do things with the number 10 often. You might do things with the number one often, or the number zero often. So it hasn't built every single big integer you might ever run into in there, yeah. but it's given you three little convenience big integers to save you from having to create your own instance whenever you need a one, a 10, or a zero. but they only exist one time. Not every single instance of big integer needs to have that. You just kind of need a factory where you could run over to Walmart and buy a tennis ball, okay? I can run over to Walmart real quick and grab, a, I can run over to big integer real quick and grab the big integer representation of a one rather than having to assemble it myself at home. Okay. So it's, it's a convenience. Though so we'll see plenty of examples of it. Um, but the punchline is, is you know, you use static context when it makes sense to use static context. If you need it once, you know, you don't need multiple instances of it. You know, the big integer one is just as good as another big integer one, which is just as good as another big integer one. So I don't need 500 big integer ones floating around. One of them's good enough. All right, so for Thursday, I'll make sure the current version of the code is pushed up there. Expand this, well, not even expand this, duplicate this code for your basketball player. So at the end, this should allow you to store a basketball player in Firebase, and then it should also show any changes that happen uh, to Firebase out inside of your listener here. So you'll see this data, you can just steal my code here, but you'll probably have basketball players there. Then you'll go ahead and build it into a basketball player, and then display that guy. So using things you've already had, but all we're doing is proving we can store it in Firebase and that we can also read it back in from Firebase automatically. Got it? So I'll push this uh, current version of the code up. So bring your code up to date with this, but for basketball players instead of patient records.
Yeah. Since I have current system, you know, if I'm finished. I just have one quick question. By the way, let me clear this real quick. The thing that's not me today, I'm going to say let's not meet today. Sorry. If you see, I'll send me a document so that I can oh. put it in. Um, did you look at the Bible homework for this week? Did huh? you look at the chapter? I did not. At all? Okay. But, um, yeah, for 1 Corinthians 5? I think I, I did, at least at the beginning of the semester, because I said I'm going through Corinthians. It just says about incest, so I'm not sure how we're supposed to apply it. Oh, it's a weird one? Yeah. I saw that. I was like, how do I apply it? Maybe just leave it out there. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, I remember so Austin just talking trying, about it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's leave it out there. Yeah. So V. Should I just send you? Okay. Okay. So it ran. Here's the changes. Here's the changes it made from the database. So it already printed it out. That is from this on data change. So when I first launched it. Can you do it again? I I really can you please do thank you. I haven't done anything. I just hit play. I just hit play. So all I've done is hit play. I haven't even opened the app yet. The app is over here somewhere, but I haven't done anything with it. All I did is hit play, and right off the bat, this on data change gets called. Oh, okay. Because it gives me the current version of my database. Okay. And I just grab all those patient records and print them out. So right now I have two patient records in there. Okay, makes sense. All right, sense. Okay. and then when I go in here and I say add a patient record, and I just type some stuff in here, say add that adds it to the database and then notice we have this new dude right here okay question is why don't um, your name and plane show up on the app too um, because I don't think I'm actually up to actually I think it does it, I just I'm just not updating it with uh, with that I can see it. oh oh it's because the only thing I actually added in the app was this guy right here. I'm not bringing stuff from the cloud into so the app we're yet. Not I'm not connecting that yet. Okay, okay. Yeah. All I'm doing is proving I can okay. get stuff from the cloud. Okay. okay. Got it? That's clear. 